Walter Spallata, son of penniless Czech immigrants who was exempt from military service because he stuttered, became a carpenter and turned his passion for aviation into an incredible collection that defied the odds. In 1984, when I was 16 years old, I took a road trip with my father to the United States Air Force Museum, and on the way back, we stopped at the Spallata farm. You won't want to miss this episode. Back in the 1980s, I was fortunate to make some amazing road trips with my father, Michael Neald. He was a professional photographer who later worked as an executive with major photographic companies. He was interested in trains, but it would always entertain my interest in aviation. While I now live in Ottawa, Canada's capital, I grew up in a place called Brampton, just north of Toronto. At the 1984 Hamilton Air Show, I met another enthusiast who had a collection of photo albums at the IPMS club table. He had just returned from Newberry, Ohio, where a gentleman named Walter Spallata had a rather interesting aircraft collection in his backyard, which included a B-36. Yes, you heard me correctly, a B-36. As Dad had promised to take me to Dayton, Ohio that summer to see the United States Air Force Museum, I told him what I had heard about this collection and asked if we might stop by as it was on the way. He wasn't convinced that we'd find it, but being an old press man, he thought the story about how to get there was intriguing enough. According to that modeler I talked to, he said, go to Newberry, Ohio, and stop at the first hardware store you find, and ask for a map to the aviation graveyard. We got to the hardware store, and I explained to the guy behind the counter what I was told about obtaining a map to the Spalata property. He laughed and said, yep, you got it right and then he produces a photocopy of a hand-drawn map with instructions about what not to do on the property. He then grabbed a spray can, placed it on the counter, and said, $6.99, you'll need a Hornet bomb if you're going there. So we collected our Hornet bomb, drove up the road, and this is what we found. This is the house by the side of the road. There's a North American Aviation T6 Texan, or Harvard as we call them up north, I couldn't find any specific information about this aircraft, such as serial numbers or build numbers, to look up any information about its service. This is the front of the family home. In an article written by Walter's son, Wally, he said that while his father was a carpenter, the family home was built from salvaged lumber from aircraft engine crates, which I think is rather fitting. In the windows, you could see piles of aircraft parts. In the background of this photo, you can see an Avro Canada CF-100 Mark V, which last flew with the Royal Canadian Air Force's 410 Squadron. It was stored at Mountain View, Ontario, which was the RCAF's version of Davis Monthan at the time. It was in the process of being scrapped in Barrie, Ontario in 1983, when Walter was notified. He drove to Barrie immediately and bought the fuselage, which you can see here. To the right of the CF-100 is a Sikorsky H-19 Chicksaw, which was taken on strength by the United States Air Force on November 1, 1954, but served primarily with the U.S. Army, including a tour at the Redstone Arsenal. It last served with the Tennessee National Guard before being transferred to Kent State University, from which Walter acquired it in the early 1980s. This DC-7B fuselage started life in May 1956 when it was sold to American Airlines. It flew with them for 10 years, at which time it was sold to a charter airline. In 1975, it was sold for scrap and was later acquired by Walter in 1977. On the left, we see the bomb nose of a Beechcraft AT-11 Kansan Bombardier Trainer. It was based on the Beechcraft Expediter and features a bomb bay, glass nose, and a gun turret. This was the 151st AT-11 built, and it was listed for sale in Pecan, Georgia two years ago. Next to it is a UC-78 Bobcat built by Sassana. It was nicknamed the Bamboo Bomber because of its wood construction. It was last flown by Caribbean traders of Miami, which must have been very difficult given the tendency of this aircraft to delaminate in humid conditions. And poking out is a Vulti Valiant trainer from 1942, which is all I could find on it. On the left is the fuselage of an LP-2J Neptune by Lockheed. This model was used in Operation Deep Freeze 3. It was used by U.S. Navy Squadron VX-6 to resupply Antarctic scientific missions and was fitted with skis and rocket assist takeoff devices. On the left is Republic F-84 Thunderstreak, 
Like many aircraft in the collection, there isn't a lot of information on this jet, other than it was involved in an accident in the UK in 1955. But it's in Southeast Asia camouflage, so who knows. It was later acquired by the Military Aircraft Preservation Society Museum, located in Akron, Ohio, and now looks like this. I'm not sure what's next to it. If you know, please leave a comment. And then there is the mystery F-86E, which has a serial number on the tail that was assigned to an F-84, so good luck with that. And then we have the elephant in the corner, the B-36. This isn't just any B-36, this is the second prototype, the YB-36, that fielded the changes from the first prototype, the XB-36. It would later be sent back to Convair, who upgraded it to the RB-36E standard. In 1957, it was retired and sent to the U.S. Air Force Museum. Later, the U.S. Air Force Museum obtained a B-36J, and this B-36 was scrapped. Before its pieces could be disposed, Walter bought it and made 36 trips to bring it home. It's still on site in various pieces. Later, Walter acquired a prototype twin Mustang and stored that inside the B-36's Bombay. Here is a legendary F2G-2 Super Corsair, designed and built by Goodyear in Ohio. It was the best Corsair ever flown, with an engine twice as powerful as the original. That said, by the time they were built, the war was over. This model ended up flying in the Thompson Trophy races in Cleveland, and it traded hands with the racers a few times. In the 1949 race, it qualified in first place with a speed of 414 miles per hour, but sadly, the engine blew on landing, and it didn't start the race. In 1950, Walter purchased it and stored it on the farm until 1997, where again, it traded hands a few more times. It raced in 2011 again, with an average speed of 398 miles per hour. Sadly, it crashed in 2012, killing the pilot. Here we see another angle of the Super Corsair, and next to it is a EF-82E twin Mustang. This model was built in 1946 and delivered to the United States Army Air Force. When the U.S. Air Force was created, it was redesignated as an F-82E. In January of 1950, it was transferred to the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor of NASA, who flew it until 1954. At that time, it was sold to Walter. In 1997, a British group bought it, but it was never shipped to the UK. It has traded hands several times, which is a recurring theme with Walter's aircraft, and is now being restored to flying condition. Roughly 25 prototype Douglas Sky Raiders were built, and this is one of them. It was found in a junkyard in Pennsylvania and bought by Walter. It has since been sold to a man in North Carolina who aims to return it to flying condition. Here are a couple of aircraft we've already seen, plus a TBM-3S Avenger with practically no history since we don't know a bureau number to go by. And this is 16-year-old me, wishing I could take one of these home. Heck, I would just wish I could have that hair back. Don't we all? Here's a view of the front of the property again, this time with the F-86L in view. It was constructed as a F-86D-60 model by North American. At some point it was converted to a L model with new electronics, extended wing tips, and wing leading edges, revised cockpit layout, and an uprated engine. It would also feature four 20mm cannons as a primary weapon. It now resides in Las Vegas, in the yard of Scroggins Aviation, which is a company that specializes in aircraft mock-ups for film production. This is a Vought F7U-3 Cutlass that came to Walter's home in the back of a school bus, according to his son. It was bought from the Navy in South Weymouth, Massachusetts, and brought back to the farm. The underpowered futuristic aircraft is now with the Military Aircraft Preservation Society Museum, located in Akron, Ohio. And this is our last slide. Here we see the Super Corsair discussed earlier with an FG-1D and a B-25 Mitchell. The 1D Corsair was displayed from 1947 to 1950 as a war memorial at the Cuyahoga Airport in Ohio, which is just by the shore of Lake Erie. I don't know if there was ever a problem with this aircraft which led it being used as a memorial, or if it was just a case of so many aircraft sitting around at the end of the war. 
Regardless, it was only a memorial until 1950, when Walter bought it and brought it home. Ken McBride bought the Corsair 15 years ago and transported it to California. Since then, there has been little news about its progress. The B-25 was built by North American Aviation at Kansas City as a J model. It was delivered to the United States Army Air Force on July 23, 1945. It was redesignated as a training aircraft and later converted to a VB-25N standard, a VIP aircraft. However, it would primarily be used as a check aircraft for pilots to keep their proficiency on twin-engine aircraft. It was sold to a private owner in Pennsylvania and then sat at the airport until purchased by Walter. In 1997, a gentleman from Georgia purchased it, but never transported it back. In 2017, Kevin Huey bought it and has been under restoration in Corning, New York. So that's the tour of the Spallotta collection from 1984. I hope you enjoyed it. My father passed away at age 84 earlier this year. I've been going through his slides and scanning them. I hope to present more videos like this in the future. There are pictures from various air shows and aircraft museums from the 1980s that I hope to show you. However, I have one set I hope to be able to show you, and that is the 1967 and 1968 Canadian Grand Prix. Although he had left the London Free Press for 3M Canada at the time, Dad still had a valid press pass, and compared to F1 tracks today, there wasn't any place he did not have access to. If you enjoyed this presentation, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Subscribe to catch more videos like this, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on future notifications. And remember to join our newsletter to get free back issues of our old magazine. And while you're there, check out our Kitco page and consider becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.